Uh, yeah, little logistical notes. All the slides are up on Twitter, so um, you can find them here and follow along if you'd like. Uh, on my, my Twitter, Ravine Kurokawa, sorry, Canyon289, uh, right here. So optional, but if you want to follow along, uh, you can. And this is a super non-technical talk, talking about uh, how to engage your business with data. Uh, very much along the lines of the keynote this morning, and not applying that, but listening to it. Uh, same idea. So let's go through the talk. All right, so uh, academic and work background. This will be relevant in a second. So I've worked at a bunch of companies over time, um, with a lot of small companies, one super old uh, Fortune 500 type of company, like 50,000 employees and a gazillion dollars of revenue. Uh, one particular famous private company that you can find on LinkedIn. And I now work for Sweetgreen, uh, which is a restaurant startup. Um, I've also, I'll point out that I interviewed a bunch of companies and, and interviews are interesting because you learn a lot about a role uh, when you're interviewing. That's so it's a two way conversation, but my degrees are in a technical background. And so a lot of these things I learned the hard way. Uh, I've changed my, uh, changed a lot over the last, what do you call it, 10 years. I guess we're going to be stuck with this black bar, so we will live with it. Um, looks like it thinks it's on dual mode. All right, well, it's going to be black bar. Uh, so a note on open source, I'll do a little bait and switch here. This is PyData, so open source is awesome and important, and that's kind of the point of this conference. So uh, if you haven't considered contributing to open source in any way, monetarily working for open source, uh, pitching things, writing tutorials, please do so. Um, if you don't know how, you can talk to anybody in a, in a green shirt. A lot of us are here contribute to open source, so please do so. So I'm also a contributor to PyMC3 and, and RVs. Uh, these buttons help anything? No. All right, so soft skills talk. Um, a bunch of these numbers will be guesstimates, so uh, including that one. I actually don't know how many numbers I guesstimated, or will guesstimate throughout the course of this talk. Uh, if something is a real um, number, it'll be it'll have like a footnote and there'll be a link that's hidden right behind here. So let's talk about the setup for this talk. Um, you have new graduate Steve. He just got a master's degree, he bachelor's, super excited to join the workforce. Uh, and he got a job at this place called Mushroom Marketplace. It's a two-sided marketplace where uh, mushroom foragers can sell their mushrooms to mushroom aficionados. So pretty standard two-sided marketplace job now that a lot of uh, kind of business model a lot of companies follow. So first question, obviously, is this a place to get drugs? Uh, no, obviously not. This is a place for legitimate people to do legitimate business. And this is part of the problem for Mushroom Marketplace. Uh, people keep you know, abusing the platform and posting uh, listings for mushrooms that are poisonous. They'll kill users, typically not something you want. Customer acquisition costs are really high if you've ever worked in a trend model. Or uh, they'll get people high, uh, which some people might want, but you probably don't want it as a business because it's pretty illegal. It's hard to run an illegal business on the internet. So he, his job is, a, uh, is the entry level mushroom quality analysis. So what he does, he gets paid somewhere between sixty to $80,000, you know, a typical sort of entry level job, you know, gets benefits so his, his parents are happy. And uh, what he has to do is verify each listing, whether it violates the terms of service of this, of this platform. Pretty mind numbing job. Uh, also a very common job. A lot of even the big high tech companies that do a lot of machine learning stuff, they have a lot of these jobs where people need to sift through listings and it can turn out to be pretty tedious. Uh, here's the marketplace. You get you get like a picture. So this is one data point you get, a picture of a, of a listing. And then you get um, some like classification level category, like numerical attributes about this mushroom. <laughs> so Steve, being pretty bored of this job, stumbles upon this really cool website. And he sees all these listings for this cool data science stuff that all these people are doing. Super excited uh, because, you know, this is what's on the news all the time. It's amazing. He also learns they get pay these people get paid like 200K and they're treated like celebrities in some circles. So he's like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. This is, this is my path out of being just sort of the uh, transactional level employee. Like this is how I can elevate myself and, and make a bunch more money and be more respected and sort of move on up in the world. Uh, fun game, one of these is not made up. So Hacker News, if anyone's familiar with it, there's an there's entire blog post about Hacker News and sort of the bizarre mentality. But sort of this is what happens in data science. You see a lot of cool new algorithms and it's very splashy and you get a lot of headlines and people get very excited about it. Um, so there's sort of a strong draw, especially if you're a newcomer, to all these, these cool things that are going on. So 
Steve decides, like a lot of um, people that are f- f- sort of fresh at a job, that he's going to hack nights and weekends to build his mushroom classifier. He's seen a lot of how to build your first classifier tutorials. He just saw Michelle Brenner's talk on how to deploy your first serverless application. So he's like, I can totally do this. This is uh, well within my reach, uh, and it's going to earn me like glory at work. Uh, so first he tries building you know, a neural network, because that's obviously the coolest algorithm that everyone has to use for the first time. Every other algorithm is trash these days. Just neural networks are bust. But it turns out they're really expensive to train neural networks, and you got to have a lot of money. Either you got to have a GPU or pay for uh, a GPU instance. He's he's just he just started his job. You know he's told to put his money in a 401k, so he doesn't have a lot of spare funds. So he decides, all right, I'll just use Scikit-Learn and I'll build a uh, standard classifier instead. So he uh, he learns Python. He spent he learns Jupyter notebooks. He learns the basics of of random forest. And uh, he built his machine learning model. It's awesome, right? He's, he spends forever. He goes through all the pain of cleaning the data. I mean, oh man, this data is awful. It doesn't have labels at the top. What the hell does all this stuff mean? But okay, let me hard code it. I'll spend all the time doing that. Then uh, I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna look at what this is. I'm gonna make a bunch of exploratory plots, a whole lot of them. And then I'm gonna fire up a model. And oh my God, I got 85% accuracy. So what he does, he takes his notebook and he goes straight into a meeting with his boss. Look at all this cool stuff I just did. I did all this data cleaning. I got all these plots. Aren't they cool? Look at all these bar charts. And uh, I built this. I built this classifier and it's got like 85% accuracy. This is great. We can totally automate. You know, half of this QA job. Things are things are going to be awesome. Um, a lot of people do this, right? This is a natural first step. You need to you need to do these steps to get into data analysis. Data analysis, and you're really excited about this, right? This is your first. Pitch. This is sort of the way you're going to get out. This was really hard. This took you 20 hours to learn. You watched so many YouTube videos. You watched all these tutorials. You went through all the bugs that I didn't show you here. Uh, great. He's thrilled. But things always seem to take a downturn from here. Um, Steve's boss is really excited. Or Steve's boss shows excitement during the meeting and, and is glad Steve's taking initiative and seems to be really engaged in the job. Uh, but after that, it doesn't really go anywhere, right? Steve just gets back to his normal day job. Nobody really asks about his model. You know, he, he messes around with it here and there, but it doesn't get pitched to the CEO. It doesn't really go any further than that uh, initial meeting. And I've seen all three of these things happen. He, Steve continues working on this model without it going anywhere until his org change. Maybe he gets a different boss and that boss really doesn't like data scientists. He just gives up because he's tired of it or he just gets frustrated at this company and quits and finds, finds a new job. Um, I've seen this happen numerous, numerous times. Sometimes it's happened to me. Um, and that's, I've, if you follow data science stuff, this is typically how it goes. You get very focused in the, the analysis part. You get that going, and you have this notebook. It has results, but suddenly you get stuck. So let's go into what, what went wrong or what could have gone wrong. Um, also, I'm totally open to questions anytime. So if anyone wants to interject with one, please feel free. Uh, but this is where uh, data science be- sometimes becomes too narrow. A lot of like data science folks or people jumping into data, if you can really focus on the data part of it. Uh, they're really focused on the machine. Well, the machine learning model usually comes first because that's like the cool, flashy thing that gets you a lot of like kudos points on Hacker News or any of the or Twitter or all these other things. Um, Clearly, you can't avoid the data cleaning part. So inevitably, you get bogged down in the data cleaning. Uh, you'll, you'll think the machine learning will take you most of your time, and the data cleaning will take 80% of your time. But you struggle through it because you know, you're real committed. Uh, and then you make a lot of visualizations, which is, could be good, but you make a lot of just a lot of visualizations uh, that tell you a lot, tell you a lot of things. Uh, and it comes from a place of what can I do with data science? So the questions you start with is, algorithms are cool. I have data. How can I use algorithms to do stuff with data? Uh, but this is pretty incongruent with how businesses think, um, especially if you listen to the keynote this morning. Businesses care about how can you make money? How can we keep making money, right? If you're making money, you want to keep making money. How can we make more money? So businesses usually want to make more money, not less money. And the, the most generic version of this is how can we generate value? And so let's talk through this. So Steve's got this cool prototype, but he's not prepared for all these other questions that come up. Uh, one set of questions that could come up, his boss could not know what any of this stuff means at all. There, are, I mean, in this room, we're fairly knowledgeable with data, but there's a large subset of the population, or actually the majority of the population, that doesn't know how these visualizations or code or anything work. So it's totally lost on them, how, maybe how hard this is, what the value could be, any, any of it. They just don't, they don't get it. Um, then let's say Steve's boss does understand uh, 
the results, right? At least understands what machine learning algorithms are. The C's boss is the QA boss. Then there's a whole bunch of other problems. How do you how do you know it's 85%, right? Like, is it going to be 85% every time? I mean, how much money do I got to put in to put this up on the on the server? Michelle talked about how expensive serverless costs are. Like, you know, stuff's not free. You know, who's going to host this? Are we going to pick? Are we we're on GCP and you use AWS? Okay, definitely a, a killer right there. Uh, there's more people resourcing, right? Well, you're a QA analyst, and if you're going to do this, who's going to do your job? Um, who's going to do the work for? modifying other parts of the application. You've got internal politics. Maybe Steve's boss doesn't want this because if you automate all the QA analysts, that boss no longer has a job, which is a real thing that could happen, right? You, your data science is not really zero sum. You're, you're dis, you could be displacing somebody. You should consider that and how that might be received. And then there's, there's legal implications. Like uh, let's say somebody gets poisoned, like this goes through Steve's algorithm, somebody gets poisoned. Is the company culpable for a machine learning algorithm that's a black box? What will happen? When there's QA analysts, you sort of have like, and Facebook does this a lot. I probably shouldn't call out a company by name, but some companies do this a lot. They say they have teams that are people that review things, uh, and that gives them sort of an out sometimes when their algorithms do the wrong thing. And that is a very interesting strategy that seems to be working really well right now. And the same question comes up for a mushroom marketplace. If we replace everyone with an algorithm and somebody gets hurt, Who's to blame for the algorithm's decision? Super important with things like uh, self-driving cars and all that. Uh, CCPA, GDPR, so we don't have a CCPA talk, but for those unaware, there's a, there's a uh, Europe passed this pretty landmark ruling on customer data protection, and then California is putting one in on January 1st uh, that is sort of freaking everyone out, including us, um, because you have, to be very, you have to be very careful with people's data. So um, are there any concerns there? I mean, I could just keep going on because these are all the things I can think that change is hard. Maybe the business works great right now. They don't need to put a machine learning algorithm in. It just seems something it's like something new that that's not doesn't help them make money or doesn't doesn't matter. Uh, the maybe the algorithm is great, but it's just super expensive to run. Uh, that's a cost. And then the last one being customer value is like, does anyone actually care about the results outputs? Uh, I've seen a lot of machine learning models been built where nobody actually really cares what the model says and makes it really hard to put it into business if nobody actually gets any value from it. And so the general point here is that the analysis is like the very first part, right? And if you, there's a lot of things that can sync your prototype and you have to consider a lot of these. And I haven't even listed all of them here. Um, so let's talk about someone else. Oh, sorry, let me switch here. So before starting a data science project, the algorithms and the data are important, of course, because that's the central core of any data analysis project. It's the name. But you should also consider um, who will the customer be, right? Like, why would, why would somebody want these results? Why would they matter? Um, are there multiple customers or they not? You should also consider what the cost will be. Um, you certainly have, there's multiple costs here. You have, you have your time cost. Um, that's probably the one you're the most sensitive to. But how much money will it cost to deploy? How many people will it take? Do you have to hire consultants? Consider what it will take to get this thing not just to the prototype, but all the way to the value creation stage. Um, consider where the business is. Um, is the business looking to grow? Is it a company that is sort of quote unquote data thinking and they want to do this? That's that's a very relevant. Um, are yeah, are other companies in your space paying a lot for data science? And then internally, are you in a, a politically strong department? Does your manager have a lot of political sway? Um, if Fortunately or unfortunately, if you work with somebody um, or work under somebody that doesn't have a lot of political sway, your prototypes might not make it far because they don't have the resources or the ability to, to get it in front of the CEO. Um, at smaller companies, it'll be a little easier. For me, you can approach somebody. But like at large companies, I'm never going to see the CEO of the company I worked for ever. I'm not, I don't have enough sway. And even my boss three levels up doesn't have enough sway to see this multinational CEO and whatnot. So consider the context of the organization that you work in and whether you're going to be able to influence the change you need to support what you're doing. And uh, a big one too is that I, I, sometimes people forget is what's the risk of these analyses? There's, there's sort of two levels of these. Um, so obviously the, the one people think about is what if my analysis is wrong? Um, in some of the companies I worked at, if an analysis was wrong, people could die. That's a pretty big deal. In this, in this case, I, it's a big deal here. I'll be honest, it's sweet green. People won't die if their salads are late, so it's a little bit easier than the last one I worked at. So I can be a little bit more, uh, I can accept the lower bar of a model accuracy in some cases because a late salad is not as bad as somebody uh, 
yeah, somebody's somebody's death. So what could happen? But then there's also uh, the uh, the sort of subtle ones is like how hard is it to keep the results right? So prototypes are cool, but I, I are the results going to be right three months from now after a bunch of stuff has changed? Like there's there's right now, and then there's right over time as you create value. That's that can be a challenge. Uh, there's another one that's also a subtle one is what if the analysis is uh is right, but people think it's wrong. So people will, you'll be right, and you're all going to be right, but it's so contrary to people's expectations, they'll react negatively to it. Um, the, the converse is, what if your analysis is wrong, but people think it's right? So sometimes people will see a wrong analysis, but they'll love the results so much, they'll start spreading it, and then you have another problem on your hands. Uh, so consider all of these things of the risk of publishing analysis and what will happen. And then, oh, the biggest question is, uh, you should really like deep dive, think, are you doing this because you saw cool posts on Hacker News and you really want to implement neural nets because that's like the cool LSTM thing that you just saw, or do you really feel like it'll truly affect the customer? I would say a lot of the time, especially as engineers or people that are in data that are in this room, we are really excited about the algorithms and then we sort of fool ourselves that it'll be actually valuable in, in a business. Uh, and then when we actually pitch it to a business person and, and they, they have the drawing realities, it's not very valuable, it's, it's painful and, and hurtful, but Try and avoid that by ask, really digging in and figuring out if this actually has value beforehand. So we're going through another case study. We're going to talk about Avery at Truffle Traders. So we have, Avery is also a new graduate, similar to Steve, has a math degree at another well-known university. Uh, she works at a, a company called Truffle Traders, which has a surprisingly similar business model to Mushroom Marketplace. Um, She's also frustrated though. She doesn't want to just be a sort of a transactional, a transactional replaceable employee. She wants to be strategic and move up. So she has the same idea. Let me create a machine learning model that'll automate this quality analysis job. So instead of me classifying whether uh, mushrooms are, are, I guess in this case, truffles are poisonous or, or of the psychedelic type and not of the edible, regular edible type, um, let me create an algorithm to do it. But she thinks about, the, she thinks about these things first. What's the current, um, What's the current challenge the company is having? What are are they looking? Are this, is the challenge growth? Is the challenge, um, is the challenge bad QA? Is the challenge resourcing? And then what's being told in the all hands? So quick hack at companies at all hands meetings, you usually get tidbits of information about what the CEO cares about. Those are good meetings to like listen in and figure out what the higher ups are thinking about. Um, she also thinks through what departments we're going to need to be um, involved if she creates a model. What are the resources? Um, she thinks about. If I create an ML model, how can I create step uh, value stepwise, not just from a full blown model? Like, are there sort of sub goals I can hit that'll get me there? And then, what are some concrete plans for for action? So remember, if you go back to Steve, no action plan there, just an algorithm. Uh, Avery thinks about what are what would people might do. Um, I'm going to note that these are yeah some of the relevant questions, but this is not an exhaustive list of relevant business questions. So what Avery does is rather than jumping straight to the algorithm, she thinks about the whole business process, not just the data portion. So the workflow here is that somebody publishes um, something to Mushroom Marketplace. So I, as a user, I'll found some mushrooms somewhere in LA, which might be dangerous. Uh, and I put them on the site for someone to buy. Because we don't know whether the mushrooms are good or not for sale, they go through a QA process. It takes about a day because somebody has to manually verify it. Uh, and users are annoyed, right? That slows down their business velocity. They have to come back the next day to see whether they're uh, mushroom listing was accepted or not. It's a real pain for, for users. She realizes that, you know what, machine learning algorithms, they have a, a distinct advantage here. They can provide instant results, right? So this is a better user experience. You get told instantly whether your listing is, is uh, positive or not, not over time. Um, this is great. She's thought about a way that it actually affects users, not that it's just a cool algorithm. Um, she's heard that Mushroom Marketplace is a big competitor the CEO doesn't like. Um, and so, she also knows that you know this whole idea of uh, total domination of an industry is like the cool thing to do, uh, even if you're losing a bunch of money to get there. So her CEO is totally in line with that vision of pushing as fast as possible. Um, she knows the engineering team doesn't have time to help her out because they've got a huge backlog doing the, the normal stuff. Uh, and she knows that for her sub motive, her selfish motive of getting a raise, her QA director is the one who's going to be who's going to be giving the raises out, right? So if she gives if she gives something to the customer experience director, uh, that might not help her get raises as much as she she helps out her own her own boss. So she wants to figure out how can she leverage data science to learn at work, get a raise, uh, and have a greener future of strategic work versus transactional work, which is what a lot of people uh, strive for in their careers. So she comes up with a plan. 
So instead of developing the real-time classifier that would be required for a uh, for a customer, she won't get the engineering resources to put that thing up. She there's a she figures out a subplane though. You can make a batch model, which means that she'll just generate predictions at the end of the day. And what she'll do is she'll just use it to double check the work of her own quality analyst. So rather than put this out with customers, she'll just she's already a QA. She's in the department. She's all her friends and colleagues are around here. They're already doing the work. She can just run the model after they've done their manual classification to see what the model would say. Um, so the things that come in here, uh, no engineering work or very little engineering work because it's a batch model, right? Much simpler to run than a full Spark streaming type of model. Um, no additional risk because no business processes are being modified. The regular work's still happening. So you're, you're good there. We checked off that box. Uh, her boss will be happy with it. So it's a politically uh, savvy move. Um, she'll get, she'll get uh, free help on training examples. So this is a big one. If anyone's actually tried building a machine learning classifier and like labeling data yourself, I don't, I don't know if anyone wants to label 10,000 data points themselves, but it usually is a huge pain. And that's like the minimum bar you need. So now she can leverage her whole department and get their, uh, get their help for free because they're already doing the classification work and if they just need to validate the model on top of all the work they're doing. Uh, and it builds confidence in a safe setting. So her team maybe hasn't used machine learning before. They might be dubious or suspicious. This gives her a way to introduce it in a non-jarring fashion. So she's checked off a lot of boxes here. And what she does is instead of putting together a notebook, she puts together this deck. Um, she gets a, a, a PowerPoint deck together, and she goes through it. So she sets up a very similar meeting with her boss. She uses a title using data to protect um, customers and a subtitle, automated mushroom quality assurance, double checks. Current challenge, lays it out. Uh, we have to process a large volume of, of mushroom listings. We can make mistakes. The cost of a, of a wrong mushroom listing might be $3,000 or so, plus the, uh, the unquantifiable risk to brand damage if, we, if one goes through. All right, so cool. We have our title slide. We have the current challenge. She talks about what machine learning is, so leveraging data. Um, she also throws in this jab that Mushroom Marketplace might also be using um, this technology. So let me jump into the role of Avery here. So if I talk about the current state of my model, um, I've done the initial data exploration, a common you know, method called decision trees is used. It's a pretty easy method where you sort of, you're at a fork and you're like, uh, does the mushroom have this color? If it's brown, then it's probably poisonous. If it's white, then it's maybe not poisonous. Those, that's how decision trees work. Right now my algorithm gets about three out of 20 right. And then if you want extra details, I have all the mathematical analysis in the back end. And this is an example of one chart of uh, how many sort of cap shapes we get for all these mushrooms. Here's my proposal. I, the QA analysts don't have to do anything different with their work. Um, they just continue looking through listings as normal. What I'll do is I'll generate a spreadsheet at the end of the day. I'll look at all the listings that we, we uh, covered today from all 10 people that are on our team. I'll run my model over them. And then I just want the QA analyst to double check the ones that are misclassified. There won't be too many because I have a pretty high accuracy rating. And it's good to do so because now we're just double checking that our customers are safe. Um, Time-wise, I don't think it'll be too much, 15 minutes from each of the analysts. And I'm willing to put in 30 minutes extra each day. Um, I think you know we can reduce the number of misses from 10% to 8%, and that'll save us about 60K a year with all the recalls and packaging and things that we need to do. Um, I, the model will get better over time. This is just something that comes up with machine learning. So we're starting at 85, but as I improve on it, maybe we'll get to 90, 95, or, or higher. Um, there's no additional risk because we're not doing much different. And I just need two weeks to train the analyst, and we'll be, we'll be good to go on this. And so future steps, um, you know, there's a couple things that I'm considering. You know, I, I have this thing called an accuracy metric, and I might change it to to recall metric. Um, I just think sometimes it's maybe we want to go through a little bit more of the listings, and just to make sure that we don't have any that go out poorly. Uh, and this this metric switch will help with that. Um, if this works out well, we can work with the engineering team to to uh, get more resources and sort of help out with the flow. And then if this is if this works out great, maybe we can start collaborating and put this into the customer workflow. And so that's sort of the pitch you'll give. And let me talk about why this is different, so, actually much different than the notebook. So um, notebooks are, I'm just going to say, notoriously business unfriendly. So if you're pitching to somebody that is not a, a notebook user, actually, even if you are pitching to a notebook user, there's a lot of ways to make a bad notebook. So just because you make a notebook doesn't put you in the success realm already. Um, there are ways to make good notebooks for other people to read. And that's a whole nother talk. But no, Jupyter notebooks themselves are not things that are easily presentable in front of uh, executives. And I'm just, I'll just say that blatantly as part of my own experience. Um, they're hard for people to open. They don't, they don't look well good in emails. Uh, 
Google slide turns out, and especially in the G Suite, turns out to be great. So a quick hack here. Um, the first slide always shows up on the email body on a, on, on a G Suite. So like when you want to get people's limited attention, this slide will show up. You want to make sure that it's, it's eye-catching. It very clearly explains what's going on. Um, and it doesn't require a math degree to figure out what it means. Uh, so the first slide is, is uh, important for advertising reasons for that. And so I think Avery did a good job here. Uh, I know, I'll give myself self-credit. I did a great job here uh, by, by putting in just the standard title and subtitle. Uh, laying out the challenge is a good one too. So the other thing with your analyses is you're not going to be able to present them to everybody. But what will typically happen is you'll present them to one or two people, and then your hope is that it'll grow legs and it'll get forwarded on to other people, right? So you're not always going to be pitching your work. You should make sure that you're laying out all the things you went through. So the two things that, are, that work out here is you're laying out the challenge that the business has. Hopefully this is visible and everybody understands it. No data or anything is being used here other than you want to lay out what the, the uh, business hurt is here. So in this case, they're losing money, but it could be any, any number of things for whatever the business happens to be. Um, I'd say it's usually good to put in a, a slide about an entry level slide about machine learning. Um, the, for good and for better and for worse, machine learning and AI and all these things are way in the hype train. They're on CNN, so a lot of different people could have a lot of opinions about what machine learning is better uh, without you know being in the details. So a slide that explains the high level approach helps people that are seeing this deck and not familiar with uh, ML in general. Um, and then the, the painful part is not showing like 95% of your analysis. Uh, the real trick here is pulling out the one or two bits that are really important that, that are, somebody can read, um, not showing every single visualization you use to debug your entire classifier and all the exploratory stuff. Um, putting, the, putting the metrics um, in a way that's easy for people to understand. So another challenge with machine learning, there are a lot of different types of metrics. They're not very well understood by a lot of people. So trying, trying to word the metrics in a way that comes up in, the, uh, in a business-friendly language and not the scikit-learn, I pulled this straight out of the documentation language. Um, a proposal for action. So what do we do after this? What am I going to require? What am I going to need? Important for two reasons. It tells Avery's boss what she plans to do. It also helps Avery's boss know what could uh, that boss, whether it's a, a he or she, what could that boss do for Avery? So Avery might need engineering support. Avery's boss can start working on those things. Um, Avery's, Avery will need two weeks of time from the team. Avery's boss can allow for this. This plan for action makes it really concrete for the action holder in the meeting to actually go do these things. Um, and then this is sort of optional, but future steps are like what the cool stuff in the future should be. So Avery's not totally giving up her vision for uh, the customer, the customer real-time model, but just showing it as a future step that's not required in the first phase step. This sort of analysis is much more business friendly um, in my opinion, than running into a meeting and showing off a Jupyter notebook. This, you, you lose people incredibly fast in my prior experience. Um, just to get a poll from the audience, has anyone had a great presentation with the Jupyter notebook? Like run in, it's gone off great. Sort of? Well, how, how did that one go? Uh, it, <laughs> yeah, it, it depends because some people are comfortable with, with code and, and have a good visual insight and, and can tell some of these things are important. But a lot of executives are either really busy, they don't have the time to sort of uh, separate the wheat from the chaff, so that's one challenge. Or a lot of them just aren't, aren't I'm going to point out, there's a lot of non-technical departments, and that's not a bad thing. They, import, they serve important functions like legal and people resource and things like that, but uh, they're, it'll be challenging for them to grasp onto your key insights. All right. So why is this better than C? Some of the things we talked about. I think business plus data is greater than just data. Um, so Avery considers the business context. She knows where her proposal should, should fit in that business context. This is incredibly important. Consider what you are in the business and what the business needs. Um, she comes up with a plan rather than a prototype. If you start with a prototype, there's two reasons this, this will be challenging. You won't really know where you're going, so that'll make it hard for you to actually finish. You'll just keep hacking on, and you'll feel like you need to do this thing forever. Um, and then you won't actually know how to get past the prototype. So everyone that starts with the prototype first that I've seen then has to somehow merge this prototype into some hacky version of something that'll actually work. If it gets deployed, it's better to think about where it's going to be because then your, your actual engineering will be better, not than not just your analysis. Um, concise communication. So being able to express concepts really quickly is actually a really big business skill. It's something that I'm still challenged with and still trying to learn. But you, in business settings, you sometimes only have seconds to make a point and, and gain a, trans, uh, a foothold in a conversation. 
uh, and trying to explain what a confusion matrix is is not gonna happen in that span of time. So you better come up with a quick ways of explaining what's happening uh, and then coming up with a strategy. Uh, so there's hurdles for implementing anything, recognizing those hurdles before you come up with a prototype. And so some of you might be saying like, I'm already a data scientist, like I don't have to do any of this crap. I just make notebooks all day. Uh, and the fact is, it's, it's because you're probably working for someone that already did all this stuff for you, right? Your CEO or your, your manager, they're justifying your pay. They're justifying the legal expenses. They've done this work and they've created this small space where you can just be a data scientist, which is cool if you just want to be a data scientist your whole life. But I think a lot of you will realize that you don't want to spend a 40, you want to then move up from there. And so if you want to move to the managerial role, you're going to have to learn all these skills anyway. Uh, because that's what managers have to do. They have to create space for their employees and these skills are required to, to do so. So I'm gonna give you the high level practical guidance. Um, so consider the context surrounding the data. Don't just consider the data and the algorithm. Uh, think about the business and the people world blocks. In my experience, this has been uh, half or more of the time has been just working with the people to either communicate what I've done or working through roadblocks that have, have come up for budgeting reasons, political reasons, org change reasons, like any any one of these things that'll happen. Um, you're gonna have to learn to be patient. It's a lot faster to, a, a computer listens to me a lot better than people listen to me. Computers just do what I tell them to do uh, and then tell me when I screw up, but they do it instantly. People take a while to change and then think about other people's perspectives. I think when we get wrapped up in the analysis, we don't always consider how other people would view this or what they would need to do. So put yourself in other people's shoes. And then the hardest one is that not every problem requires a data solution. Like a lot of problems actually don't require a data solution and a lot of problems are actually work fine if people just do them. And they look manual and they're frustrating, but like as a business, you don't need an algorithm to solve all your, your problems. And th th that's the painful thing you might have to come up with. Your business might not need, I don't know, MapReduce for their Excel workbooks, which is a thing I've heard about uh, people ask about, like, you don't need Hadoop for everything. This, this, this goes way past data. Um, the engineering tools don't always fit the need. So since this is a, I want to give you things to Google because this is a whole topic in and of itself, but words to research include things like coalition building, how to work with different people and get them onto the same page. Like, so how do you get two department heads to um, want to work together and, and build your model? Um, influencing change in people is a good one. Obviously, communication and negotiation are big. And then um, a big one, since a part of this is people wanting to progress in their career, is just personal branding, right? Like, do people view, view you as an expert in that in that company? Do they view you as a data expert? How do they view you? And that'll that has a lot of effect on how your analyses will get uh, presented and where they'll get shown. And so, like data skills, um, I presented like when I say data, right? There's a lot that goes into if, into data. There's there's anal there's analyst skills with Tableau. There's data science skills with, with machine learning and, uh, and algorithmic approaches. There's, there's uh, engineering, which is a lot of like how to set up infrastructure, right? Just like that, there's these same sub-disciplines in, in the sort of uh, business strategy skills. So think about it that way as well. Um, and there's no one size fits all. So I think there's the no free lunch thing for algorithms. You know, one algorithm doesn't solve every possible data science problem ever. And it's the same thing with, with these skills. Um, presentation skills are like one portion of it, but you're gonna also have to learn verbal communication skills outside of presentations. You'll have to learn how P&L works in companies and some level of finance. Like there's a lot of these little pieces that you'll pick up over time. Um, so I'm gonna give you a bunch of resources um, to go into this. So from people that are technical, uh, if we, there's uh, Vicky Boykis is a data scientist in Philadelphia. She's, she's actually really good, I think. And she's got this great um, blog where she talks about the software side of data science. So I have a bunch of articles that are relevant to this talk, but her whole Substack blog is actually very good. Um, Scott Hanselman, he is a uh, he's a developer, not a data scientist, but he has a really good blog post that's just along this about how technology doesn't always have to be the latest and greatest to to be useful in a business, and and how there's a lot of people that you know use Angular 1.4 or VBA, and they they do perfectly fine in, in their company. They don't need to switch to Python three or and any Scala and all this other stuff. Um, and a lot of companies have posted on this as, as too. So in, in companies engineering blog posts, sometimes read into the articles that aren't just like how to set up Hadoop and MapReduce or, or serverless or any of these things. There are blog posts from like Airbnb that talk about how they set up data focused organizations. And in there you'll learn what are the managers thinking about? Because these are the roles that you're trying to get. You should realize how they're being created for you. So in this post, Airbnb talks a lot about whether data science teams are great centralized, whether they should all work in one area, whether they should be split apart in different regions and the pros and cons to each. These have very real consequences to the efficacy of 
of organizations of, of whether you're an embedded data scientist in uh, the data department or whether you're on someone else's team. Like a lot can change between those those sorts of things. Um, and then completely outside of the scope of data, uh, there's there's a Harvard Business Review and, and sort of these uh, management consulting or NBA type articles. I know NBA is probably a dirty word here. Somebody will, I don't know. Hopefully won't beat me up after this, but MBAs, um, MBA type articles like Harvard Business Review have a lot of uh, great tips on how to make data useful in an organization. These are two where they they're on the on the cover article, but these days actually they have a, almost every every um, every magazine has at least one article about how data can be useful in the organization. They have all the other ones, of course, about how to do restructuring and financial things and where to take risk or not, but. Buried in there are really good tidbits about how data is being used at Google and their people analytics department, how it failed in the people analytics department in certain ways, and how Google overcame that. You can learn, um, you can use these to, to develop those skills of the softer side of data. Um, there's also plenty of just generally good um, books. I have three of them posted here that have helped me. Um, but these are ways to, to work in negotiations. So a really good example for something something to negotiate on. You present an analysis, and your boss was like, great, can you put it in production next week? And suddenly, you're going to find yourself in a negotiation to get enough timeline to actually build this thing right. Or you're going to work a lot of weekends and get frustrated. So whether you think you're negotiating or not, by just being at a company, you're always engaging in some level of negotiation. And it's good to understand how that dynamic uh, works. And, uh, and Coursera uh, has a lot of great courses on these as well. So between these four, um, hopefully, one of these will help you. I've actually got five. Sorry, another one. Uh, and there's also podcasts. So there's this, there's this uh, podcast called Career Tools. Um, and I want to make sort of the pitch that even if, even if you feel like you're, uh, you're going to move out of data or you become a product manager, like just by engaging in a job, you will have to develop a whole set of skills um, to flourish in that, in that position. So you know, if you're putting 10 out of 10 chips on data science, my advice would be maybe, you know, spend 8 to 10 on the data science stuff, do the self-driving nano degree and watch the YouTube, watch these Pi Data talks or whatever, but then put 2 out of 10 um, on, on the soft skills and, and areas where you can improve at work in your presentation address or whatever it may be. Um, and so with that, I will take questions. Thanks for a great talk, Kumar. Yeah, you mentioned um, wanting to have somebody in the chain for the accountability portion of that. Mm -hmm. What's the long-term solution that you see for that, especially as um, the, Facebook, you were mentioning, wants to have uh, those belly buttons and that account, uh, that person for accountability. What will be the solution? I mean, it, so this is why I, I will give the blanket statement that this is why my presentation was so generic. It's going to depend heavily on where your business is, what country you work in, what country your, your application is going to get deployed in, right? And because uh, suddenly, all every company who's here is going to be accountable for the data in, uh, in in their servers for California, all of them, because CCPA is coming in, in January first, and now a legal department is now informing decisions that we were previously just making out like by ourselves. And this is just because California just changed their ruling. Um, so the generic answer is it, it depends, but I think you should definitely spend the discovery work to understand um, who's accountable for the cost, right? Who's going to pay for this thing? Who's accountable for the people that you need? Because you, you might need engineering resources. Somebody will be putting this data in, whether it's a customer or whether it's your company. Somebody's accountable for those people. So you want to, you know, if you're uh, like Mark Roden, who's a volunteer here, he's accountable for the people that are trying to defraud Ticketmaster. And so he's got to make sure that he knows who's, who's working with those people or figuring out what to do with those people. Uh, and then they're legal and people. So think for your business, all the people that are required, all the legal considerations. And those are the people that will be accountable on your list. So um, in my company, for example, my uh, a boss in another department has given me like a cute little mini challenge just to sort of like see what data is about because he's trying to be more data driven. And you know, my mind as a data scientist is like, oh, let's do fancy models and stuff. Um, I was wondering what your take is on trying to uh, leverage that opportunity and have the executive think of it not just as like a cute project with like a cute like accuracy result, but something that they can actually use. So you, let me let me and let me see what you're trying to get out of this. So one is you're trying to get taken seriously, right? Like, what do you want to happen to your model? Do you want do you want your reputation to be like solidified as someone who's serious about your work? Do you want this model to go in production? Like, what is what is your objective? My objective. 
objective is to have it go into production and something that they can use long term, even after I'm not there, even after I leave. Okay, so there's a couple of routes you could take here. Um, one is you could you could have sort of a hardball meeting with that boss and be like, I'm not the type of person that just does these cutesy analysis. Like if we're doing this model, we're doing it for real. And so you better back it to production. I'm not doing this whatsoever, right? Because you have an opportunity to cost your time and you're not going to do this halfway stuff. You could you go that route. I don't know what relation you have with this boss. Or you could... Um, you could work the other way. Like if if this boss isn't taking you seriously, you could find another person in the company that will want the, re they don't care about the model, but they just want the positive results. Mm -hmm. And you could try telling that person, hey, I'm building this model for my other boss, but it's gonna help you this way. Then that other, other hopefully high ranking executive will hold you, that manager accountable, right? And then so then you'll be able to push something in production without you having to push it through. Or you could just try and push it to production yourself if you have enough influence in the organization to really s slam through and get, and get what you need done. But you, I would, I think you're thinking the right way. I would also ask, why isn't your boss interested in this model? Because I, in my, I'm, I'm broadly speaking here because I don't know the situation, but I feel like there could be a tension where your boss is maybe expecting results from you, and now you're spending four to five hours or whatever amount of time a day doing something that another boss wants, right? And so, this guy, or this guy or girl is justifying your salary and and holding your head count, but you're really working for this other person. Like, are you? going to hurt yourself on reviews? Are you going to be shortchanging yourself on what your boss is asking you to do? So consider maybe those factors. Thank you. Hopefully that helps. Hi, um, great talk, by the way. Um, my question is, how do you, uh, when talking to a non-technical person about these results, how do you um, share your results without oversimplifying the findings uh, in a way that uh, is un uh, understandable and also, uh, I guess, actionable? So the most universal thing that you can always talk about is money. Like 100%, everyone will want to hear about how much money they're either going to make or how much money they're going to save. So if you can if you can get a strong pitch that you're going to do something with money and get it and make someone rich, they'll be very motivated to help you out. That's like the most common denominator uh, in almost every business. Now, uh, I luckily have been fortunate enough to work at businesses that are also mission driven. Uh, two of them at this point. So if you can connect something to the mission of the company, that's sort of another leverage point to to um, show that you're working in the direction that the company wants to work for. Uh, I'd say those are the two most generic and biggest levers. Um, but other than that, like there's uh, there's sort of five five portions of power. Like you'll do stuff for your friends because they're your friends, right? There's this thing called referent power because you're, you're close to them. So if you're really good and people really like you, that's another way to get people to take you seriously and want to help you out. So if your boss thinks you're a great person and wants you to advance in a company, maybe the interest then isn't for the company, but the interest is in keeping you at the organization and moving forward. So understand the interests, I'd say, and then try and align to any those interests of the people you're trying to influence. I think this might be our last. One quick question is, when would you say is the best time to pitch an idea? Um, a lot of times, real world experience, you have a situation where, okay, I have an idea, I can create fake data and potentially come up with a solution but at the same time, I don't want to go through the entire process and it amounts to nothing as well. So I know a lot of this is dependent on your manager and also CEOs, et cetera, et cetera. But in your experience, well, it's, when's the best time to get your idea off the ground? This is a tough one because it's super context dependent. Um, but I'd say clearly, the, the, it again depends on what your objective is. So if you're honestly, if your objective is, I don't know what to say anyway. If your objective is just to learn, like you really just want to learn something and use the data, then the best time is just like just go out and just do it, right? Because all you want to do is use the technology. But just then understand that your objective is to learn and that it probably won't go anywhere past your learning. That's the value of it. So start whenever if you're going to learn. If it's in a business, though, it's going to depend on, uh, like if you're at a startup, did you just, if it's going to require, well, does, if your business requires money, did, uh, did you just raise a funding round and do you have extra money to go through things? Uh, if your business had a, a, a high-powered executive that really does not like data, does not think data is important, or does not value it, that executive would just get fired. Well, it's a pretty good time to start pitching data, because um, now you have that roadblock that's gone, right? Um, did you like? What else? Let me try to fabricate another scenario off the top of my head. Another one could be either business uh, state growth uh, growth objectives just got announced. So the CEO just said every every department has got to grow their business by 10%, right? That's a pretty good time because now you might have a solution to grow the business by 10%. Or the other one is risk. If the, your business just went through a huge risk cycle, something really bad happened, like you can also go like 
create a model that'll do something that'll be on the cost avoidance side or data analysis or whatever. So I can't give like a one size fits all answer. Like it really is, how big is your company? Where do you work? How much risk do you want to take? Like, are you willing to stake yourself so hard on this model that you're gonna you're gonna get into your boss's office and tell him that you, if you don't get this, you're gonna quit, which is a viable strategy. Just you're gonna have to maybe get fired. Or do you uh, are you the type of person that wants to play it safe and um, don't want to, you don't want to rock the boat too much? So I'm sorry I can't give you a precise answer, but those are sort of the high level considerations again. All right, thanks for being Kumar for the uh, making data relevant in business.